Hi, everybody, and welcome to Dr. Archer's Lectures. In this video, we're going to be talking about money, and in the next lecture, we're going to be talking about banking and monetary policy. It's a fascinating area, and I think you'll find there's a lot about banking that's familiar, but there's a lot about money and banking that you might find surprising and interesting. So let's start with the very basics. Let's define what money is. Money is more than just those greenback dollars that we have in our wallets. There are three qualifications that make something function as money. One of them is it's a medium of exchange. This is the one we're most familiar with. If I want <clears throat> a soft drink, I give the vendor a couple of dollars and he gives me a drink. That medium of exchange. The second one is the unit of account. Uh, speaking of a couple of dollars, that's how prices are posted in, in the, the monetary values. And so when we think about $2, in our minds, we know how much $2 is, and, and that's a clear picture of the value that's expected. And then third, it's a store of value. Interestingly enough, you are not required to spend all the money that comes your way. You can set aside some of it to use for future purchases or, or in case of future emergencies. And so in order to function as money, something must meet all three of these criteria. So there are a couple different kinds of money, and we often hear this discussed in political circles. The first is commodity money. Commodity money is just like it sounds. It takes the form of a commodity with an intrinsic value. And you often hear politicians talk about the gold standard. Gold coins have a, a monetary, a commodity value. And also in prison movies and things like that, we see prisoners often exchange cigarettes as a form of money. It works in the same way. The reason that this has become political is up until the early 1970s, the US dollar used to be backed by gold. In other words, there was enough gold in the Federal Reserve to, to account for the paper money and then and the coins that were out in circulation. That's called the gold standard. We went off the gold standard in the early 70s, as did most of the rest of the world, all of the rest of the world pretty much, um, because the economies got so large that the gold standard being a finite commodity became a restriction. So now we have what's called fiat money. Fiat money is money that has no intrinsic value of its own. When you think about those greenback dollars that we have in our wallets, other than the fact that the government has said these are worth one dollar, it's just a it's just a piece of paper with some gray green ink on it. It doesn't have any value of its own. So that's fiat money. So money is circulating throughout the economy, and the amount of money that's circulating throughout the economy determines how much we have available to buy goods and services. And how much we have available to buy goods and services depends on, it, it, it limits the demand, it, it, it decides the demand, and it also decides how much producers will produce because they don't want to produce to a level where there's a surplus. So the size of the money supply is an important consideration for our overall economy. So let's think a little bit about what is the money supply. The money supply is simply the total quantity of money that's available in the economy, all the money that's out there. <clears throat> There's two different money supplies, if you will. The M1 money supply has three components. Currency, that's all those greenback dollars that you have in your wallet or wherever else. Demand deposits, those are your bank deposits, and these are important. And these are the, the demand deposits that you can write a check against. And then the third uh, category is just a general category of traveler's checks 
and other checkable deposits. Um, that's not a very large part of this. As you would expect, demand deposits is a big portion of this. And then, of course, the currency that's in circulation is a large portion, too. When we go to the M2 money supply, oh, the M1 money supply as of March of 2017 in the U.S. was $3.4 trillion. The M2 money supply is everything that's in the M1. So you've got currency, <laughs> demand deposits, and traveler's checks. And then you have also added to that savings account and small time deposits and money market mutual funds and a few other categories. When you add those savings accounts and things in, the M2 money supply is much larger than the M1. In fact, in March 2017, the M2 was $13.3 trillion. This is because money in these savings deposits and mutual funds and things like that, it tends to stay in the bank. And so it, it becomes a bigger part of the money supply. The distinction between M1 and M2 is not a matter that we talk about much in this class. I just wanted to let you know that there is a difference. But essentially, from now on, when we talk about the money supply, we're just talking about the money supply, the M1. So how is money created? Well, if you're thinking about just the pieces of paper, the, the, um, the, the treasury prints those. But that's really not the essence of what money is. Money is much more than just those pieces of paper. So in fact, money bankable dollars are created by banks when they make loans. Banks are the ones that create money. They grant a loan and increase the borrower's checking account with a few keystrokes and money is created. So let me back up and make sure that that's clear. I take a deposit to the bank. So there's $100 in my checking account that I just put in. The bank takes that $100, they set aside some reserve, and they, put, they, they loan $90 to you. You take that money and you put it into your bank account. So now the bank is showing $90 in your account and $100 in my account, that's $190. And remember, the total bank deposits is a component of the M1 money supply. So when we increase total bank deposits from $100 to $190, we've just increased the money supply. Money has been created. So what keeps the banks from just going wild with that, just, just creating money upon money upon money? Well, the bank's ability to create money is li limited by the Federal Reserve System. And we'll talk in this video lecture and the next one a little bit about some of the roles that the Federal Reserve assumes that limit that ability for them to create money. <clears throat> so it's actually the Fed, the Federal Reserve, that controls the money supply. So let's talk a little bit about how it works. This is called fractional reserve banking. And in fractional reserve banking, banks keep a fraction of the deposits as reserves. And the rest of it, they loan out to other customers. The Fed establishes those reserve requirements as regulations on the minimum amount of reserves that the bank can hold. So the bank decides how much the, the banks must hold in reserve. And why do the banks hold reserves? The banks hold reserves so that if I come in and want my $100 back, if I want to withdraw it, they have money to give me. <clears throat> the reserve ratio, R, is the fraction of deposits 
that banks hold as reserve. This is an important distinction. The reserve ratio is the fraction of the total deposits that the bank has to hold as reserves. And total reserves as a percentage of total deposits. Total reserves equals the required reserve the amount that's, that the Fed requires that they hold in reserve plus the excess reserves. And excess reserves, by the way, is just everything that they're holding beyond what's required by the Fed. Very simple. But this equation right here is going to be an important consideration as we begin to work through the problems. So take a minute and note this. Total reserves equals required reserves plus excess reserves. So let's look at this. A T account is a simplified accounting statement that shows a bank's assets and liabilities. For those of you who have taken accounting, you know T accounts. This is a basic of accounting. For those of you who haven't taken your accounting yet, this is a preview of coming attractions. So it looks like this. First National Bank has assets of reserves of $10 and loans of $90, and they have liabilities of $100. Their deposits are considered liabilities. Okay, so let's, let's unpack that for a second. Assets are things the bank owns. Liabilities are things the bank owes assets they own, liabilities they owe. So why would the deposits that they have on hand be considered liabilities? Why is that something that the banks owe? Because those deposits don't belong to the bank. The bank is just holding them. That $100 that I put in the bank, that's my $100. And if I come and want it back, they've got to give it to me. That is something the bank owes to me. Assets, on the other hand, are the reserves that the bank is holding, plus any loans that they have outstanding, money that borrowers owe to the bank. Those are assets. Those are things that the bank owns. Notice, too, that the two sides of this T account balance. We have $100 in deposits on the liability side, and on the asset side, we have $10 in reserves and $90 in loans for a total of $100. They have to be equal. <clears throat> so the bank's liabilities include the deposits, the assets include the loans and reserves. In this example, notice that R, the reserve ratio equals 10%. In this example, the Federal Reserve has said, you must keep reserves of 10% of your total deposits. So the bank has $100 in total deposits. 10% of that must be kept in reserve. So $10 is kept here in reserve and then they have the rest of it out on loan. Now remember that equation that we saw on the last slide? Total reserves equals required reserves plus excess reserves. If we think about that, we can see that this bank doesn't have any excess reserves. All they have are the required reserves, and that's all there is. So as we go through this example, if, if the reserve ratio is 10%, well then First National Bank has loaned out all but 10% of its deposits. So it has $100 in deposits. It's required to keep only 10% of those reserves. Well, the money has just come into the bank, so it's all considered reserves. The bank hasn't loaned out any of it yet. Keeping in mind that equation, total reserves 
equals required reserves plus excess reserves. The, the required reserves are 10% or $10, which means that their excess reserves in this case are $90. Well, what do you do with excess reserves? If you're the bank, you loan them out because how does the bank make its personal profit? It makes its profit on the interest that it charges to borrowers to borrow the money. So if you have $90 in excess reserves, loan it out and start collecting the interest on that. And that's exactly what we see here. <clears throat> in this case, they've kept $10 in reserves. And now they have $90 out on loan, $90 out on loan. The borrowers have $90 in cur currency. So there's $100 in the bank plus $90 in currency, hard cash that the bank has given to their borrowers. That just increased the money supply. The M1 money supply is currency plus total deposits plus um, <clears throat> traveler's checks and other small uh, deposit, or deposit accounts. So currency is 90, bank deposits are 100. Now the money supply has jumped to 190. The bank has just created money. It's magic, isn't it? Currency plus deposits. So $90 in currency plus $100 in deposits gives you $190. The bank has created money. So now let's say that the borrower deposits that $90 at another bank. So now this bank has a new bank deposit of $90, $90. And initially it looks like this, that $90 comes into the bank and it's all held in reserve, but you know, it doesn't stay like that, does it? The Federal Reserve requires that the bank keep a certain 10% in reserve, but the rest of it are excess reserves. And what do banks do with excess reserves? They loan them out. So here's the way it looks. If the reserve ratio, if the Fed requires 10% be held in reserve for uh, SMB, then SMB will loan out all but 10% of the deposits. So now they have to, they have to keep 10% in reserve, that's $9, but the other $81 goes out as a loan to another borrower. What's that borrower going to do with the money? That borrower is going to put it into their bank account. So now you have another new bank deposit at this bank or some other bank. And what is the bank going to do? Set aside the, the reserve, $8.10, and loan the rest of it out as excess reserves. And the money can just keep going around and around and around like that until it's completely exhausted in excess reserve. Well, how, and each time the bank passes, the money passes through the bank, it increases the money supply. There's a new bank deposit, it increases the money supply each time it goes around the circle. So how far can that go? How much can the bank ultimately, or can, can, the money supply ultimately increase by the time this initial deposit has gone through the entire banking system. Well, we could make this a long drawn out arithmetic problem. 90 minus nine, they loan out 81, $8.10 set aside and they loan out um, $82 or whatever that is, and so on and so forth but there's a faster and a better way. And here's what that looks like. It's called the money multiplier. The money multiplier will tell you the amount of money that the banking system generates 
for each dollar of reserve. So using this, we can tell exactly how much the money supply is going to increase. We find that the money multiplier is simply one divided by the required reserve ratio. So in this case, it would be one divided by 0 0.1, 0 0.1 being the decimal version of 10%. So when you divide one divided by 0 0.1, your money multiplier turns out to be 10. Remember that we started with $100, and so that $100 ultimately will create $1,000. The initial deposit, $100, times the money multiplier of 10. And so that's our lecture for today for Dr. Archer's Lectures. Thanks for being here. Come back and see me next time when we're going to go into more detail on the role of banks and monetary policy. Look forward to seeing you then.